Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Rain Garden Workshop for the Town of North Hempstead. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, you might you might know me if you were at the Native Plant Gardening Workshop a couple weeks ago, but my name is Megan Festuka, and I am an environmental specialist with the Town of North Hempstead, and I work on sustainability projects, including the creation of native plant gardens in the town's parks. Uh, before we start, I just want to remind you that everyone's been muted, so if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box at any time, and then we're going to stop at a few different intervals during the presentation to answer the questions. And as you probably heard, we will be recording this workshop, and it's going to be posted on the town sustainability page so that you can go back and watch it if you miss anything, and anyone who did miss this workshop tonight can watch it after the fact. So now I am happy to introduce Rusty Schmidt. He's a landscape ecologist for the environmental consulting firm Nelson Pope and Voorhees and also the president of the Long Island Native Plan Initiative. And he works on many different projects involving the creation of rain gardens and different native plantings on Long Island. He's very passionate about his work and definitely has been a great mentor for me in my work for the town, as well as planting native plants in my own home. So I want to thank you so much for being here tonight, Rusty, and whenever you're ready, you can share your screen and get started. I'm assuming you can see that? Yep. Okay, good. So um, um, yes, I'm going to talk about rain gardens. Um, I want to try to keep things moving it's going to be I have a, I have a, a lot more slides than I have time so uh, when we run out of time I'll just show pretty pretty pictures at the end but I want to get make sure to get all the important information out um, so the what so you know before I tell you what a rain garden is I want to explain why so it's about clean water we we want that we're surrounded by this beautiful water in our lakes, our bays, our streams. Um, and what we really need to do is protect that for us and for the future. Um, and what we've done is we've created our own problems. So for instance, um, what we've done is in the upper left corner here, this is before we started building here, when the rains fell, 40% of the water evaporated, transpired back into the atmosphere, and 50% would soak into the ground, either into the shallow uh, shallow infiltration, which goes out to our lake streams and bays, or deep into our uh, reservoir, into our um, into our aquifer, which is where we get our drinking water. And only 10% of the water ran off the landscape, and that was enough to keep our you know streams running and our lakes uh, full. Uh, but then we built, and so the bottom left is uh, kind of uh, an example of what we do here on Long Island. Um, We've built and 35 to 50 percent of the water uh, of our land is impervious. An impervious surface is something that doesn't allow the water to get back into the groundwater because it gets stopped. So it's things like the roof of your house, your driveway, the street out front, um, you know, the garage, the shed, all those things. And so with that, uh, and you think about your own property, it's probably close to around 35, 50 percent of your property is impervious. And so now when the rains fall, only 70% of the water goes up or down instead of 90%, 35 back into the atmosphere, uh, and, and only about 35 of the 50 going back into the groundwater. And that we have a threefold increase of 30% of our water is running off the landscape. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the main reasons why uh, we have more severe and frequent floods. And we have uh, other things going on as well. So for instance, uh, when we have landscapes like uh, Target, I'm from Minnesota, if you haven't figured out this accent. So I'm from Minnesota. And, uh, and so I pick on Target because they're a Minnesota company. But if you have these big parking lots, look at all that impervious surface, not allowing water to soak into the ground. We only have 5% of the landscape is actually in uh, grasses or things that could potentially uh, soak into the ground. And we also have, uh, and then we've also created these systems that move water quickly. 
So um, you might consider that area along the street a curb and gutter. I consider it a, a new age stream. Uh, when the water falls on the landscape, it runs down these uh, curb and gutter. Anything that's in that curb and gutter is bringing water to the drains, and those drains are directing the water either into our groundwater or out to our bays. And so it's picking up things like leaves and grass clippings, um, which have high nutrient loads like nitrogen and phosphorus, but it also might be picking up uh, sands and silts. It could be picking up dog waste, cigarette butts, candy bar wrappers, heavy metals. Every time you step on the brake of your car, you're leaving heavy metals behind and those wash off the street. And then petroleum products, not only from the asphalt, but also drips and drops from your car. So all those things go up to our waters and we, have, uh, we create our own issues. And so for us here in Long Island, the big one is our bays. Um, one pound of nitrogen that gets out to, the, out to the bay can make anywhere from 250 to 750 pounds of algae. And these algae blooms are what's causing issues like hypoxia or areas where there's no oxygen left in the bay, or worse yet, uh, algal blooms like the red tides, brown tines, and crimson tides. So this is uh, the summer of 2016. These are all the impaired water bodies that happened around Long Island in 2016. So in the Hempstead area, you can see that the, uh, a large area was both hypoxic, meaning that the oxygen was so low that our animals couldn't uh, survive it. And we also seem to have a mahogany tide that was causing issues with uh, where it could actually damage um, uh, uh, our animal, uh, 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 not damage. It could cause issues with killing some of our animals that are drinking the water and or causing it to be where our shellfish are so toxic that we can't eat them. In 2018, we skipped a couple of years. You can see that again, in our area, we have a lot of hypoxia zones, but we also have harmful uh, uh, algae, algal blooms and uh, toxic blue-green algal blooms. And in 2020, you can continue to see that hypoxia zone is being uh, very, is, is still pretty large in that, in that stretch. And so what has happened with all these things is that it, it, provide, it inhibits uh, fishing, uh, swimming, um, and some of the recreations that we'd like to do. It also is more importantly causing some issues with our animals and plant life that are in the waters. And once we have these nitrogens, phosphoruses, and other chemicals in the water, it's almost impossible to pull back out. It's very, very expensive and very, and, and very difficult. Uh, so what we so things like street sweeping is a great opportunity to collect some of that stuff, but you can tell that that only happens once or twice a year. We really need to start thinking about how do we get rid of those, uh, stop that algae and, and things before it even gets to the water, or it helps stop those nitrogen and phosphorus and pollutants before it even gets to the water and causing those problems. So what we're going to talk about is rain gardens and, uh, and, and how they can be a helpful hand. Um, but before I do that, one more thing that I want to talk about is um, uh, how much water comes off of your own property. So this is a typical uh, town of North Hempstead size, size property. It's uh, about an eighth acre lot. It has a thousand square foot house on it. And, uh, or, or sorry, it has a um, 1500 square foot house and a thousand square foot driveway. And so if the water rains came and dropped an inch of rain on this house and it directs the water out to the street and down the street, what happens? So in that one inch rain event off of that 1500 square foot house, you get 925 gallons of water of runoff from the house alone. And we get another 600 gallons of water from the, from the driveway. So we get 1,500 gallons of water off the house and the driveway out to the street uh, that, that, that doesn't have that chance to soak in the ground. Then that green area, uh, because it's not in native plants with deep roots, what, we, what we'll find is that our, our sandy conditions, um, but have shallow roots like lawns uh, or yards, 
um, doesn't allow water to soak in the ground either. And so what, what you might call a, a yard or a lawn, I will call green concrete. That, uh, it's, that, that soils are compacted even if they're sandy and the, so and the roots are shallow. And from that one inch rain event, only a quarter of an inch soaks in the ground and the rest runs off the landscape. So that's another 3,800 gallons of water, adding it all up to 5,400 gallons of water from that one one inch rain event. And that's just one house on the block. Because we have designed these homes uh, to get the water off of the house and off the landscape and out to the street as fast as possible, um, it is uh, the reason we did that is that water was public enemy number one for a very long time. And so we really needed to start thinking about how can we redo this landscape? So that's where a rain garden comes in. What is a rain garden? A rain garden is a small bowl uh, in the landscape that we put, in, uh, that we dig out and we place in the landscape that we collect stormwater or rainwater uh, from, the, uh, from the sky or off the land and, and stops it before it gets out to the street or into our dry wells. So for instance, uh, so this one on the left is uh, rain garden. It is a shallow bowl. Uh, we put it, uh, we catch the water off the street in this case. Uh, this one is taking water from the parking lot um, and that water sits there for less than a day. A rain garden is only a rain garden if the rain, if the water soaks in the ground in one day or less. If it sits there longer in a day, it's not a rain garden. It is, excuse me, it's a swamp, a bog, uh, a pond, it's something else. A rain garden have, can only allow the water to sit there for one day or less. And then we plant it with deep rooted plants. So why rain gardens? It's to protect our wetlands, rivers, streams, bays, and the Long Island Sound. We are not trying to solve flooding problems. We're trying to improve water quality that's going down the street. And if we get that first inch and a half of rain stopped in a rain garden, the rest of the water is pretty clean and we can continue to allow that to be um, uh, uh, travel to our lake streams and bays. So if we take that rain garden and we cut it in half, what we do is we, we can direct water to it like number one off of a parking lot, driveway, sidewalk, or we can have it come out of a pipe that comes off like the downspout off your house and lets that water come into this garden. We make a shallow bowl, six to 12 inches deep, and most of that water, 90% of it, will soak in the ground and do number three, infiltrate back into our groundwater, leaving clean and cool. So what happens when we build this rain garden with our, our, with our plants is we get healthy soils. And those healthy soils with plant roots um, that have bacteria, amoebas, protozoa, things like that, mycorrhizae, fungi, all those things and, and uh, uh, collect and clean a lot of that water, supply that water and the nutrients to the plants and uh, the plants grow from that, that within two to three feet underneath that soil, that water is getting to drinkable quality standards, soaking back into the ground, deeper into the ground. Now, we still need to provide a number four, a safe outlet when we have too much water. Um, when we get the the, you know, the Ida storm or Sandy storm, we have to allow water to leave in a safe manner. So that outlet, that number four is really important. And uh, no matter how much you might despise your neighbor, you cannot send it into the neighbor's house. So we have to protect it and have it as a protection to get deep into the soil or, or to allow it to run off the landscape in, in a protected way and not cause erosion or cause problems with um, uh, with neighbors or flooding other places. And then last thing, we planted with number five, deep-rooted plants. Uh, so, okay, can't find the button, there it is. Uh, so we like using native plants. And most of the reason why we think, most people think we wanna use native plants is because of the birds and the butterflies. And absolutely that's true. The birds and the butterflies do get benefits from our, our gardens. Um, but more importantly, it's the deep roots. So lawn grass has roots that are only a couple inches deep. Most of our plants, especially our 
native plants like um, uh, our grasses and flowers have roots that go multiple feet deep. And in this one, this is this native grass, which is uh, a river oats, it, I broke it at a foot. I couldn't get any deeper. I know the roots go much, much deeper than that. How this works is that our native plants and especially our prairie plants have roots that go uh, multiple feet deep. So for instance, sod, lawn grass goes a couple inches. Purple cone flowers, um, you, uh, I think most people know what those are, or black-eyed Susans, most people know what those are. They put roots down around five to six feet. Um, uh, our native grasses like big blue stem, which is this one, and little blue stem have roots that go down around eight feet. We have some plants like lead plant, this first one, it's a, 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 a short shrub that's only two feet tall, has roots that go down 15 feet. And so why this is important, and some of these in this picture are not from uh, Long Island, but those, these, the ones that I just pointed out are, um, why this is important is all plants, doesn't matter if it's your potted plant uh, of African violets um, or herbs in the window, your tomatoes out in the garden, the lawn grass, the trees, the shrubs, the flowers, the grasses, all plants, they all slough off a third of their roots annually. They stop growing one third of the roots, putting down new, new roots, looking for new nutrients and new water. And those old roots decompose and decay and leave a hole in the soil. So, so think of them as a backward straw. So now you have a hole in the soil and we have a bunch of names for them. They are macropore or root channel, but what happens with that is when water finds these holes, they follow those holes down as deep as the hole is. So if you're in, in grass, it only goes down a couple inches. Your hosta and daylily that you have out in the front yard, they have roots that are about a foot deep. They are four times better than lawn grass. But these other plants, our shrubs, our trees, and especially our prairie plants can put roots and put water down five, six, eight, and even 12 or 15 feet deep in the soil column. And as it's going deeper into the soil column, it's getting cleaned and cooled more and more as it goes. And it has the ability to improve infiltration rates and allow water to soak back into the groundwater. In fact, um, what, what our research is showing is that by planting with native plants, deep-rooted native plants, the infiltration rate will double in a year and triple in, two to, in three to five years. And if you don't quite believe me with those images, I just wanna show you this one. So um, uh, five years ago or six years ago, my daughter was, uh, was, um, came home for spring break and uh, she and I went, took the train down to Washington, D.C. and at the National Arboretum, um, they had this display and uh, the, and, and what it is, is these are all native plants across the U.S., um, but many of them are right, can be found right here in Long Island. So here is little blue stem, for instance, and it has roots around eight feet tall. And, uh, and so some of these plants like switchgrass can go down 15 feet. And so, or this broom sedge, also very common native plant, goes down about eight to 10 feet. And you can see that these plants have roots that go very, very deep. And you can see that they're even tied up. That's how long they are. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked about plants for a second, I want to get into um, uh, uh, an opportunity that there you have here in the town of North Hempstead. Town of North Hempstead is, is putting out, uh, or is hoping to put out, they're, wait, they're trying to get a grant, is to receive a grant from Nassau Dakota County Soil and Water Conservation District for town residents to um, get up to $350 per household to replace their lawn uh, with uh, or an existing garden space with native plants or a rain garden. Um, so this is an opportunity to get part of your garden funded. Um, so funding is limited. Applications that meet the requirements will be accepted on a first come first serve basis. Um, you can go to the website um, to get that information. Um, but uh, right now you're just gonna get the information. We're still waiting on the grant as far as I know. 
Uh, did I miss anything, um, Megan? Um, no, I just I just want to reiterate that we we've applied for the funding, so we don't have it yet. So I'm hopeful that we will get it, but you know, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> so yeah. I would. Um, we should probably know about mid April. So I I will definitely email everyone that registered for this workshop um, once we have details if we get the funding. So keep keep a lookout for that if you're interested. And then the other thing that people ask a lot is how do these um, how do you purchase plants? Where do you find native plants? And here's a few that I want to point out. Uh, Long Island Natives is in Eastport, uh, and War Warner Nursery is out in Southampton, unfortunately. But uh, both of these companies do a really good job of supplying native plants that can be purchased on a retail basis. Um, I would recommend going to their websites. And if before you try to scribble down everything, you might want to just take a picture with your phone or a screenshot if you're watching on your phone and you can get this information, reach out to them, ask what they have, ask what you, or, or better yet, say, send them a plant list of these are the things I'm looking for and they can um, uh, do, uh, they can um, um, do a, a quick uh, uh, response saying, yes, we have them, this is the cost, what do you think? And then set it up so that when you go, then go out there and pick them up um, or have them delivered, and uh, when you uh, pick them up, you're not overspending or getting distracted about other things. So that's it's a good way of going about it. Decker's Nursery is a retail nursery in East Northport, not too far away for you. Um, and they always have uh, native plants from Long Island Natives and uh, Glover. And then um, Limpy, I'm the president of Limpy. It's the Long Island Native Plant Initiative. It's a terrible acronym for a great program. <laughs> Uh, but we will have a spring, uh, we're trying to have a spring sale in May, in uh, um, mid, mid to late May, and then we always have a fall plant sale. But during the season from May until uh, October, um, if you're interested in buying plants, you can at, uh, reach out to us at uh, limpy.org and uh, they, and we will, um, uh, and you can uh, arrange a time uh, to uh, purchase plants from us, and so it's uh, it. We don't have a place to come and, and come to on a regular basis. We don't have staff uh, that are out there all the time. But you buy an appointment, you can uh, buy plants from us. Um, and now I'm going to do one more thing. I have a little rain garden video. So what I'm going to do is show this video, and then after the video, then I'm going to ask some questions. I'll uh, do questions. So, um, oops, hold on. <laughs> Why is that coming to the wrong screen? That's not helping you at all. There we go. Okay, so um, here's a little video. So this, before I start here, um, uh, this young man and I were taking a walk and he stopped and looked at this rain garden during a rain day, which was awesome. So I videoed this. And so the water is coming down, um, uh, uh, coming down the creek or down the, the curb of the street uh, and going into, we have a little rain guardian that collects all the gunk and that lets the water out. You can see it's starting to fill up this rain garden. And you can see the water on this side and none on that side. The water is coming in, fills in this rain garden. When the rain garden's full, it just doesn't take any more water and the excess will go down the street. But you can uh, see that it's planted with cardinal flower. And this is a, a full shade garden. Uh, cardinal flower, geraniums, uh, some really cool um, uh, sedges, um, some turtle heads, uh, some irises. Uh, so there's a, a variety of things going on. So you can watch the video here and hear the rain. I don't think we're really getting sound from it, but we can. Oh, uh, okay. See it. That's okay. You can still see it though.
So um, does anybody have any questions? This is a good spot to stop and ask questions. So far, there was only one question. I kind of answered it, um, but someone asked, uh, would a rain garden increase mosquitoes, ticks, or other similar bugs? Um, <laughs> as, as far as mosquitoes, I said no, because the water should be draining, as you said, within 24 hours. Otherwise, it's not a rain garden. But if you have anything to add, please do. Yeah, so um, ticks shouldn't be in there. Um, your, your, your yard is probably uh, pretty tick free because it's lawn grass. They really need to be in the, the deeper stuff. And so you're usually not putting rain gardens in the middle of the woods. Uh, so, um, you, uh, so it shouldn't be an issue. Um, uh, and then as for mosquitoes, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, they're actually a way to uh, stop mosquitoes. Uh, you get the water into the site, uh, fills up, the, the mosquitoes lay their eggs, and then it dries out um, and desiccates the eggs and the and or larvae because mosquitoes need a week. Uh, for here on Long Island, most mosquitoes need a week. The fastest mosquito is three days. Uh, being in water to uh, go from egg to larvae to mosquito and uh, these things dry out and desiccate in that time and, and kill the and kill the mosquito eggs. So that's kind of the, that's the answer to that one. Um, but it's a good question. I was gonna cover it later, so you just beat me to the punch. Thank you. All right, we have another question. Um, how do you install a rain garden when the sidewalk is between the property and the street? Yep, I will get to that in a little bit. What we're gonna, what uh, in, you do not need to put it up by the street like this. In fact, this is, um, you're gonna, if you do do something like this, you need to get a right of way permit with your town because the technically between the sidewalk and the street, you do not own, even though you have to maintain it, take care of it. Um, that's the right of way of the town or village that you live in. And so they technically own that. Um, but there is a way to uh, do that. We can put, uh, we have another box that can get underneath the sidewalk and you can put the rain garden behind the sidewalk if you're really trying to take water off the street. But for you, for most of you, what I'm gonna recommend is take the water off the house. So now you don't have to worry about it. You can put it closer to the house. I'll show you a whole bunch of those in just a little bit and, uh, and keep the water um, uh, up in the landscape a little bit more and not worry about trying to get it from the street. Great, one more question. Uh, what do you do if too much water is diverted and it does not drain? Oh, um, it should, it, uh, um, so we design them so that it drains in one day or less. And to know that we're gonna test the soil. Again, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. The depth of the garden is way more important than the size of the garden. So back to that little sketch that I did earlier, you have to have a safe outlet. So for instance, in this picture, the water is coming down the street falls into this rain garden. When the garden is full, it just doesn't take any more water and the water will bypass and go down the hill, just like the picture that I just showed you in the video. So then what happens is when it stops raining, uh, that water is constantly soaking in the ground and, and we design this bowl so that the water comes in and soaks in the ground in one day or less. And we do that by testing the soil, which you can do and I'll show you how to do it and so that we make the garden that it will soak in the ground in less than a day. Great, thank you. All right, that's all the questions for now. So let's keep moving. Keep moving, okay. So <laughs> this is a study that was done in the state of Minnesota at Burnsville, Minnesota. Um, uh, it was a study between uh, Bar Engineering and where I worked at URS. And, what, and exactly what we just explained, the water comes down the street into this garden uh, and then moves on. This garden is nine inches deep. So it, when it's full, it's nine inches full, meaning that if I it's full and I step in the middle, it, uh, my pants leg up will be, you know, from the, from the soles up nine inches up my leg will be wet and everything up above that will be dry. So how this study worked is what we did is, the first thing we did is we figured out an area. So we, reached out to a whole bunch of neighborhoods in the city of Burnsville asking for volunteers to have a free rain garden put in the yard. And the neighborhood uh, uh, that we decided on was this green area 
because they had 17 uh, homeowners volunteer out of the 25 homeowners. It was a higher percentage. So that's why we chose that neighborhood. At the corner, um, we, had, uh, we have two catch basins. And so what we did is this neighborhood and this neighborhood brought all their water to this catch basin. And in the catch basins, those are the drains along the side of the road. What we did is we put monitoring equipment in there measuring the volume of water and the quality of water that was coming from those two neighborhoods. Then, uh, and, and you can see that this neighborhood is just two blocks away from a lake. This was Crystal Lake in Minnesota. And the gardens are still there. We built these in 2004 and uh, they still are working proudly uh, in the neighborhood. So almost 20 years now. Um, so the, uh, here's the gardens. The green blobs in this neighborhood are the, are the rain gardens and there's 17 of them. There's a few homeowners that said no and that's okay. We just, uh, we just didn't use their homes. One of the homeowners came back to us a year later after we built the rain gardens and said, please, can I have a rain garden? And we said no, uh, because it would ruin the study. We, that wasn't the real answer. Actually, it was no, because we spent all the money building the 17 that we had. Um, uh, it, it's a true story. And there's a moral to the story. And the moral to the story is if the village town or Hamlet comes to you and says, we'd like to build a rain garden in your front yard, the answer is yes, because Rusty told you to. Okay, so here's the actual study. So before we built rain gardens, um, in 2003 and 2000, uh, 2002 and 2003, uh, we, we measured how much water was going down the catch basins. Uh, and so you can see that the red line and the blue line were just about the same uh, for, the, for the amount of water that was going down the catch basins in a, in a storm event. We calculated an algorithm, a math equation, to figure out what is uh, the difference between the two. And so that once we had that algorithm in 2004, we built the rain gardens uh, in the neighborhood with rain gardens. And you can see that uh, the blue line is from the neighborhood without uh, rain gardens and the little red squiggle is the neighborhood with rain gardens. So this was a three quarter inch rain event uh, in May of 2004 after we built the rain gardens. And you can see that uh, most of the water is going down the catch basin uh, from the neighborhood without and very little water is going down the catch basin with the neighborhood with rain gardens. In fact, in 2004, 83% of the rain never went down the catch basin. 83% of the rain went into the rain gardens got soaked up, cleaned, soaked in the ground in a day or less. And uh, it still went to Crystal Lake, but it took it two weeks to two months to get to Crystal Lake through the groundwater than going two minutes down the pipe and into Crystal Lake. In 2005, it was 90%. And in 2006, it was 93%. It got better with age, like we all do. Uh, the rains, uh, the infiltration rates got faster, the water soaked in the ground faster, and they got better with age. And the main reason for it is, and you already know the answer, the plant roots. Um, those roots got bigger, bolder, deeper, and the water infiltrated faster. We never got over 93%, and that's because just like here in Minnesota, they get monster rains. And uh, we get when we get the big rains, we capture the first uh, inch, inch and a half of water, and everything after that goes down the drain. But we're getting the dirtiest water in the rain gardens. And they look kind of cool. So when standing here in 2004, in August, you can see four, uh, three rain gardens across the street. One, two, three. One in the foreground, four rain gardens in this one spot. In 2005, or then later that year in October in 2004, you can see that they look a little different. We have different plants blooming and things so that you can see that they look different month to month to month. Okay, so now we've explained why. We've explained what's the purpose, where, where you know, uh, you know the, uh, how well they work and a few other things. You know, here's how. So from here on out is how and pretty pictures. Okay, so the first is how. So what we're gonna do is um, we're, we want to look at building a rain garden on this gentleman's property. The first thing that we did is got the utilities marked. And so we know where all the utility lines are. 
So we want to avoid utility lines and septic tanks or cesspools. Um, we want to avoid all of those things. And then the next thing, I'm working my way up this, this list. The next thing is, is I want to stay away 10 feet away from basements. Um, to, uh, basements, when you, what happens when water goes into a rain garden is that it doesn't go straight down. It goes out like a mushroom shape. And so what you need to do is when it's going down in that mushroom shape, that the bottom has to be lower than the basement. So 10, 10 feet away uh, around standard basements will be perfect so that the water isn't touching the walls and potentially getting into the basement of your house. Um, and so now with that said, uh, a basement, you don't have a basement under this garage and you don't have a basement along this driveway or street. So when you have, um, uh, a different foundation. It's a shallower, just a few feet foundation of, of, the, of the road bed, driveway bed, or the base of your garage, four feet is your minimum. So you can actually stay four feet from a slab or 10 feet from a basement. Now what I do is I go out in the rain and I see where the water is flowing. So in this case, the water flows down the driveway, off the sidewalk, and across the grass. And I have this downspout from the house that goes out uh, this way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the downspout off the house, bring it out to this rain garden, put a rain garden right here in the foreground, and we're gonna take the water off the driveway and off the house into this foreground of this rain garden. So here it is um, a little while later. So we, we're four feet from here to the bottom of the rain garden. So four feet. It's only about 10 feet across and it comes back up and it's four feet from here to the garden in this way. So the rain garden is really only about this big. The garden itself is bigger. Here's the reason for it, is we actually measured how much water would be coming from the driveway and the house. And you can see that driveway pipe, or I mean from the house pipe, from the garage, here's the pipe that lets the water in. Um, we measured it, and for many homes, a six foot by eight foot garden, 48 square feet, uh, in this case it was one foot deep, is enough to capture, uh, so 48 cubic feet is enough to capture the water from a one inch rain event. Um, and so we're, we don't have to go very big. And we, but we wanted to build the garden bigger because of the size of the yard. And so we needed to make it the garden bigger, even the rain garden wasn't as big, just so that we have an opportunity to have a little more show and, and be more substantial in the garden. However, as I said earlier, the depth of the garden is way more important than the size. I don't care if you make a two foot by two foot rain garden, if the depth is right and the water soaks in the ground correctly. If you make it small and it works, what are you gonna do next year? likely expand it and make it bigger. So how to dig that garden? Most people think that we would wanna put the rain garden at the bottom of the hill. It's actually the less likely place to put it. It's actually easier to put a rain garden on a slope than it is on the bottom of the hill. The reason for that is in this, here's that slope. What we can do is we can loosen this soil up, drag it over, make a dam, and I can make a nine inch deep rain garden without having to dig out or haul away soil. We use the soil for a dam. It's a lot easier to build and you don't have to get rid of soil. It's like the hardest thing to get rid of uh, here on Long Island is the excess soil. The depth of the garden is how deep the garden is when it's full. So in this case, nine inches, when it goes straight across here, it's nine inches deep before it goes over the dam. In this case, that uh, might be the bottom of the hill, um, the depth of the garden is however deep it is before it goes out the side. So uh, the depth is when it's full, if I step in the middle, how far will it come up my leg? Okay. Um, so that's kind of the, that's the ideals on, or idea on how that is built. Um, and I'll explain the depth in a second, how to choose that, um, but it, it's a little bit easier now. In your yard, if you have that wet spot in the back corner of your yard and it's damp for you know, less than a day, 
or or you know just barely over a day, you already have a natural rain garden. All you have to do is plant it. You do not need to dig it out. You can just plant it with deep rooted native plants and it will soak in the ground faster and dry it out. However, if you have that wet spot in the corner of your yard that's wet for two days, three days a week, planting a rain garden uphill from that rain garden or from that wet spot will actually dry out the wet spot on the bottom of the hill. So this building it in a slope is gonna do twofold, dry out down the hill and um, make it easier for you to build. So this is what it looks like. Um, here's the, the, it's 10 feet from the house. Here's the rain garden. Here's the dam. The dam was not planted at this time. Um, we bought all these plants. She stuffed more plants in the garden instead of planting on the berm. So uh, we replanted the berm. We left the plants inside, but we added some more plants on the dam and allow that water in. So here's the other trick is I don't like when it's full, I don't want the water to go over the dam. If it goes over the dam, what happens is it starts to erode the dam. What I like to do is have it go around the dam. So how do you do that? So the water comes in this way and uh, the bottom of the garden is let's say six inches deep. So then that dam is, uh, is eight or nine inches taller than the bottom of the garden. So it holds all the water. And so if this is six inches deep, uh, this up here is, is also equal to six inches. So the water fills in this, eventually when it overflows, goes out this way and around the dam. And so the dam is taller than this spot right there. And this is that, and you can see this is a full shade garden. And you can see that you can see from a same angle or a different angle, same garden. Uh, here's the bowl. You can make, uh, you can, on the dam, you can cover them in rocks. You can start making, uh, if you have a steep hill, you can make gardens with retaining walls and put in a little rain garden behind each retaining wall. You can even use uh, retaining walls that make the garden a little bit taller. So you get this uh, little rain garden here, or in this case, we have water coming down into a rain barrel, overflow from the rain barrel out to a rain garden uh, uh, to the left of this, uh, of this uh, walkway. Um, so the first growing season is the hardest. Um, you can see here's the rain, that's that first rain garden that I showed you. Here's the water coming in. We needed to add a little rock. We had a little erosion here. So we had to slow down the water coming out of the pipe. Um, so after that first bunch of rains, we noticed where do we need to make a little couple edits? So we needed to plant a few more plants in here and add a little rock, slow it down, let the water fill in this garden. Um, we needed to, in uh, this year that we planted, this was like 2007 or so, um, it, it was a dry, dry summer. And so we had to actually add a little water um, to get the plants to establish. But once the plants are established, you'll never water these rain gardens again. The rain that Mother Earth, or Mother Nature gives to us is all we need, and uh, you'll not need irrigation for these gardens, but you made that first year. And then um, if you're planting really small plants and you're putting a foot of water over them, you can drown the plants the first year, so you might have to take a little water out. That's very rare, but it does happen every once in a while. Um, but if here in Long Island, we don't find little plants very often, so we're getting full-size plants, you don't have to worry about it. Um, you just need the plants to be taller than the water and so they can breathe. And then the last thing is we need to pull weeds. Um, and uh, so that first year after you plant, you'll probably be out there monthly to weed, weed, uh, weed the garden. Then after that, the second year after, um, you might need to go out there um, every other month. And then the third year and beyond, um, you, could you should be able to get away with weeding once around the time the dandelions are turning yellow, so a couple more weeks from now, then around July 4th time, and then maybe in August, and that's it. So 
rain gardens, how to plant. So here we're gonna get into the into all the little design tips now. So the first thing I keep saying is the depth is way more important than the size. So how do we figure out the depth? So to do that, what I'm gonna suggest is you dig a hole about the size of a coffee can. Um, and uh, so nine, 12 inches across, a foot deep, fill it up with water in the area that you would like to build your rain garden. And then once you've dug, out the, dug it out, filled it up with water, I tend to use this really expensive uh, a popsicle stick, or it could be a stick or your, you know, a toothpick, whatever, something that tells you where the water starts when you fill it up. Uh, and then uh, you can use your credit card if you'd like. If you do, give me a call. I'll come out and help you. Uh, so anyway, you put in, the, put in that stick indicating where the water starts, and then you walk away for an hour. And after an hour, you come back and you measure how much the water has gone down from the, from the popsicle stick, in this case, to the top of the water. So how far did that go? And you're going to do the only math, or what, the, the only math I'm going to teach you is, let's say it soaked in the ground one quarter of an inch in an hour. So if, it's a, if you want to have the water disappear in 24 hours, you take that measurement, you times it by 24, and whatever that second measurement is, is the depth of your garden. So a quarter of an inch times 24 is six inches. So we're gonna make our rain garden six inches deep. By the way, that's pretty bad clay soil here on Long Island. In Kansas City, that's really good soil. But here, that's pretty bad clay soil. If you have the water soak in the ground a half inch an hour, half inch times 24 is 12 inches, you can make your rain garden 12 inches deep. So if you get anything over a half inch, an inch an hour, or I have seen 10 inches in an hour here on Long Island, your water is soaking in the ground super fast. And you just do not build your rain garden over 12 inches. Just because you can take more water doesn't mean you should. So the depth of your garden is six to 12 inches here on Long Island. 12 inches is probably gonna be max. Um, and the reason for that is you have a number of plants that can't handle more than 12 inches of water on their stems before you kill them. So your plant palette shrinks significantly every inch beyond 12 inches. Just about every plant you want is gonna be in 12 inches or less water. Um, then uh, we, with this measurement, you're also going to help select your plants. So we'll get to that in a second or in a few more slides, but uh, the depth is important to help you with plant selection as well. So we're going to choose plants that can handle more water or less water depending on this measurement. Then we need to get the water to the garden. You can just extend pipes all the way to the garden. It's my least favorite way of doing it, but it can be done. My favorite way is to actually go into Home, uh, home Depot or, or Lowe's or whatever and get this NDS box or, or so maybe North Dakota Sioux, um, NDS. Uh, it is, the box is uh, a, a nine, nine inches by nine inches, a foot deep, and it has a, a place for a pipe in it and you can put this box right next to the foundation of your house. The house will keep it from freezing, even in 30, 40 below weather in Minnesota. And the water then goes out, comes into this box and goes out the pipe. And the pipe just has to have a pitch to it downhill to your rain garden down away from your house. And so this works really well of extending the pipe out to the garden without being on the surface where it's a tripping hazard or having to move, move every time you wanna mow the grass. You can also put in a French drain. A French drain is just a trench uh, that you put a drain tile in or a pipe with holes in it, an infiltration pipe. And you can put this, if you have the house with no gutters, the water falls off the house. You put this right where the drip line is, falls on the rock, goes into the pipe and out to the rain garden. Or you can, if you have a very narrow space between your house and the neighbor's house, less than 10 feet from both houses, so, you know, 20, you know, it's only 20 feet between you and the neighbor, you can actually put in this um, uh, tr a French drain 
water coming from the neighbor's house, from your house, goes into the, into the drain, fills in the uh, pipe, and then you can send that pipe to the front yard or backyard where you have more room. If you have a water problem up against the house, line this with rubber or plastic, and you'll keep the water from going into the house and getting it all into this pipe and out to the garden downhill uh, from, your, from the house. I've dried, I've dried out many a home from water from the surface uh, here, in, here on Long Island and other places just by using this French drain. And you can also get water to your garden uh, through a trench drain off of the driveway uh, or sidewalk, uh, or, and these are um, like gutters with the metal grate, water falls into that and gets rolled out to the rain garden in the foreground. Or in this case, we have a dry creek bed. It's the same thing uh, as a French drain. We just are planting, putting different kinds of rock in there so it doesn't move and, um, and filling it in uh, so that the water falls in and goes downhill to our rain garden. And the last thing um, is that you can drive a pipe under a sidewalk. So in this case, the homeowner has a downspout between the door and the garage, it falls on this landscaping and then down the driveway. So what we did is we're gonna drive this pipe underneath the sidewalk. We're not gonna break up the sidewalk. What we did is we bought a piece of pipe that's two feet longer than the width of the sidewalk. So if this is a six foot sidewalk, we got an eight foot pipe. I cut a trench so that the bottom of the pipe sits in the bottom of the trench and the top of the pipe is below the RCA um, gray rock that is underneath your, your sidewalk, which is your foundation. Um, and so you might have to dig that trench out about 10 inches, uh, four, three inch pipe or four inch pipe in the bottom. Then uh, here's the fun part. You're gonna put, out, and then you're gonna dig a hole where you're aiming on the other side. So you dug a hole on this side, you've dug a, a trench here, you put the pipe in and we're gonna push it underneath. To push it, here's the fun part, you get your garden hose out, you put it into the pipe, you turn on the pipe full blast, and then you wiggle the pipe back and forth a little bit. And what happens is you're pushing the pipe, the water is blowing out the uh, 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 sand and, and, and soil in front of the pipe, and it's coming out the back of the pipe. It also is creating a lubricant, and you just can kind of slide, wiggle and slide that pipe all the way through to the hole on the other side. Occasionally you find a big rock and you get a rubber mallet out and you give it a little encouragement and uh, it pops out on the other side. Um, I've only, uh, one out of a hundred times have I hit a big rock that I had to start over. It happens occasionally. You just go buy a lottery ticket when you hit that day, you're just that lucky, I guess. Uh, so then, then once you get it on the other side, now it's just simple plumbing, bring in the drain from the house into this pipe, let it go out the other side and build a rain garden on the other side of the sidewalk. So we're going to walk you through a rain garden um, uh, fairly quickly here. Uh, so this is the construction. We've, we're 10 feet from the basement, four feet from the, um, from the um, um, yep, back porch. So I've stayed in my rules barely. Um, we're gonna put a rain garden in, our, in this area that has the white rope. Um, uh, once I put the rope out and kind of like the area, um, I, us uh, I usually have the client work with me on this. And then I have the client look from the kitchen window or from the driveway or the sidewalk or the porch and make sure it's the right area. The other thing that I do is I never bend these anymore. Uh, I never did anyway, but if I'm gonna bend it, I'm gonna bend it out this way so that it's easier to mow so you don't have these little triangles and the other side go out and up the, this uh, fence line. So again, we don't have these little triangles. Once we have the area, I cut the sod. I like using this um, sod cutter. It's a, it's a sod kicker, it's called. And so it's, uh, in this case, it's Kevin powered. <laughs> when I'm using it, it's rusty powered. Uh, what you're doing is there's a bar on the back side of this thing right here, and you kick it and it moves about a foot and a half, two feet. You pull it back an inch and you kick it and you do it again. You pull it back an inch, you kick it and you do it again, and you can cut out all the sod. And what I like about it is 
It goes pretty quick. It's just as fast as a gas powered one, but it's a lot less heavy, easier to manipulate. And uh, you never have these gardens so big that you can't do it in about 10, 15 minutes. Once we have cut the sod out, um, the next thing that we do is we roll up that sod. I put it out on the curb. Um, if I don't need it in my, in my yard, I put it out on the curb. I put a sign on it, it says free sod. I go into you know, uh, Facebook Marketplace and say here, free sod here, and it disappears within an hour. And then you have to take down the post. Otherwise people will come knocking on your door at eight o'clock at night while you're having dinner. Then dig out the sod. What we're gonna do is double dig. So we're gonna pull, uh, or not double dig. We're gonna dig out three inches more soil than you need. So if you need a 12 inch rain garden, you're gonna actually remove 15 inches of soil. If you want a um, six inch deep rain garden, you're gonna remove nine inches of soil. So remove three extra inches of soil um, than, than, uh, than the depth of your final garden. So in this case, we're digging it out and uh, putting, uh, and uh, this was a pretty flat area. I, I had to just haul it away. Then after we did that, we double dug, meaning that we took pitchforks and shovels and went down another six to 10 inches to a foot to loosen the soil. Um, when you're close to your house, invariably that soil is compacted and you need to loosen that soil. So what my good test is, is you take your shovel, drop it in the middle of the garden. If it sticks standing straight up, you're loose and you're good. And so it's, it's gonna work out fine. Now we remember we've removed three extra inches of soil. So what we're gonna do now is amend the soil by adding compost. So we're gonna add three more inches of compost back into the garden and mix it in. So the reason why we're adding three inches of compost was there wasn't very much topsoil there because your lawn grass doesn't break topsoil deep into the soil column. And what little topsoil you had probably left with the sod. So the best thing you can do is we need a little organic. So we're just gonna put three inches down. So remove 15 inches for a 12 inch deep rain garden, put three inches of compost back in and mix it up. Then uh, we rake it out, get a flat bottom bowl, steep slide, flat bottom bowl, steep slide in all directions. Um, and to make sure it's the right depth, you get out your laser level. I'm sure you all have one and you measure your, your um, garden. So you measure where the water is going out, measure at the bottom and make sure you have the right depth. I'm gonna show you another method other than a laser level in just a minute. So once you're happy with the depth, what I always do is mulch then plant. The reason why I mulch is I always have a crew of people when I'm working, by the way, we built this rain garden in an hour um, because I had five, six people with me and we dug it out pretty quickly. And, um, and so, but I'm gonna tell you for your first rain garden, it's gonna take somewhere around uh, 30 to 40 hours to build the first rain garden because you're gonna to go to the store five times, you're gonna to go to the plant store three times, you're gonna go buy mulch a second time and you're just gonna, you just, and you're gonna, overly think it. I don't have to think it anymore. And so it's a good estimate. In 40 hours, or well, you know, uh, 30 hours, I should say, 30 hours, you and one other person can get that done in a weekend. So it's 15 hours a piece, you can get it done in a weekend. Um, so I just want to give you an idea of how much time it takes to build a rain garden. Um, uh, anyway, so now we've mulched it. And because I have multiple people, by mulching it, I'm not compacting that soil and, and um, you know, by stepping on it to plant. So I don't count. Um, so this, this was a six inch deep rain garden. We put three inches of mulch down. So now it only looks like it's three inches, but the mulch just kind of adds a zero. It holds water, the water soaks in between. It works really, really well. Um, and so, uh, and the mulch is to protect from weeds and, uh, and just dress up the garden. So if you're gonna mulch first, here's the trick. You take your biggest pot, you uh, move the mulch aside, dig the hole, plant your pot, put the mulch back. Uh, when you have that empty pot, you go to another big pot, you take the mulch, put it into that pot, dig the hole, plant the, gar plant, the plant. Now you have two empty pots. 
one for mulch, one for dirt, and you just keep going and, and planting all the rest of the plants. If you would like to uh, plant first, then mulch, try to make as few steps into the garden as possible and compacting the soil because you've loosened it up so much, you put all that work into loosening it. But what here's my trick then, is you plant the plant, take the pot, turn it upside down and put it over the plant. Plant the plant, turn the pot upside down, put it over the plant. So that when you're done, you have a whole bunch of upside down plant pots in your garden. Now you can throw the mulch and you're not gonna crush or make plants disappear. And it's a good way of protecting the plants as you're mulching. Okay, so we're gonna do it one more time. Um, we've dug out the garden. This time we didn't use a sod cutter, we used a tiller. And so we had to pick out all the sod, uh, but we've loosened the soil. We've raked the soil over to a dam. And so we've got that dam on this one side. Uh, we're doing another, uh, we've gotten it close. Now we're doing the double digging or loosening it up one more time. You can use a tiller that works just as well as a pitchfork. Once you've uh, loosened up the soil, now it's time to test to make sure you have the right, and we've already put the compost in and mixed it in. Now we gotta touch, test the depth. So what I do in this case is I put a stake on both sides, run a string across it. There's a thing called a string bob or a level bob. Um, and so what it is, is it's a little bubble for like a level uh, that you can put on your string. It just hooks to a string and it makes the string level. So then what you do is once you have your string level going across from one side to the other, <coughs> excuse me, you measure from the string to the top of the dam, string to the bottom of the garden, and you can find how deep it is. What I like to do is I put a whole bunch of stakes all the way around, um, tie the string to one side and have a mark on all, this, all the other lines. And then I can keep going back and forth and testing a whole bunch of places until I know it's level all the way across. We've, and now it's time to, we put a little more uh, compost over uh, the dam and now we're putting in mulch and we're gonna put mulch in about uh, three inches deep. And you can see this uh, is, Mike guys can see he is um, uh, trenching. So in this case, he trenched to put in this, uh, uh, um, uh, yep, plastic edger. I personally don't like plastic edgers when what happens is, and I can go to the next slide, what happens is when the frost heaves it up, not if, when the frost heaves it up and it's a quarter inch taller, the water coming across hits that and goes around your garden instead of going into your garden. What I like to use instead is a flat edge, like a steel edger, or better yet, segmented edgers like um, pavers, brick, things like that. I think they look better. And then what I really like about it is I can put my lawnmower on it and on one wheel and go around. And if frost heaves that up, it's just a few bricks. I can pick up the bricks, move a little soil and put them back down. Um, I think I'm gonna stop right there. Uh, before I get into plant selection, do we have some questions? Yes, we have a few questions. Um, so I, you kind of talked about this with the, um, with the piping, but someone asked how do you get the downspout all the way to the front? I believe they're probably talking about that first garden you showed where it was kind of at the end of the driveway. Yeah, so I'll go back quick. So, um, so what we did is I put in this box, and then I put the pipe in there. And so then, and that's what was in that garden is that there's a box behind that little uh, hydrangea, the water falls into that box and then the pipe goes from there all the way out. So what we did is we cut the sod, made the trench, put in the pipe, put the soil back, put the sod right back down over the top. Great, and speaking of that box, it was, it's called an, I think someone's asking what it was called. You said it was an NDS box. Yeah, I don't know what NDS stands for, but you can find it in Home Depot, aisle 16, three quarters of the way down on the right. No, I don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the plumbing section. Um, it is about three quarters of the way down the aisle on the right, 
but I don't know the I don't know what the aisle number is, but it's in the plumbing Honestly, section. You know that. Yeah, it would be funny, right? <laughs> um, every anyway. Home Depot on Long Island. <laughs> yeah, right. They, they, well, they're all built the same. Um, anyway, the the it's called an NDS. You can get them online. You can get them at Home Depot or Lowe's or your Ace Hardware, whatever your pre preference is. But um, uh, yeah, uh, like North Dakota Sioux, NDS. So. Okay. Um, someone wants to know where you rent a sod cutter. Any of your local rental centers tend to have them. Um, so um, uh, I, I, wherever you live, look at your local rental centers. Uh, um, things like uh, ABC Rental or, or whatever your local folks are, they call them ahead of time, ask for a sod kicker before you get the sod cutter. But Home Depot has them as well. So you can do Home Depot. They tend not to have the sod kickers. It tends to be the rental places that have the sod kickers instead of the sod cutters. Thank you. Um, someone wants to know, I don't know if you'll be talking about this later, so you can hold off if so, but what is the cost of hiring someone to create a rain garden? Uh, create or build. So I'm gonna give you two different prices. The design can be fairly inexpensive. Um, uh, for build, for designing a rain garden. Uh, there are some good people here on Long Island that charge in that, uh, you know, 500 bucks to $1,500 range. Um, but to build a rain garden by a contractor, um, uh, it's gonna it, they're going to be anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000, depending on how big your garden is that you're designing. Now, the cost of a garden to install yourself, I told you it's about a weekend of time, the cost to build a rain garden averages around 500 to $1,000 uh, for depending on how big you're making it and how many plants you're, you're putting in. It's the mulch and the, and the compost is inexpensive. It's the plant cost that is the expensive part. And uh, it depends on how big a plants and where you get them. Um, I'm, I think I know the answer to this question, but someone asked, can you put vegetables in a rain garden? Yes, um, I have. I tend not to put the root vegetables in like carrots and potatoes. They, it could be too much water and they could rot them, but I will put, I have strawberries in my garden and blueberries in my garden all the time. Um, uh, I have had, uh, and those are here in Long Island. Um, I have had in other locations tomatoes um, and peppers in gardens, in rain gardens. Um, so there was a terrace garden way back of uh, rock terrace that the front garden was all vegetables. That was the sunny, the only sunny bit in that entire yard. And so we had her put her tomatoes and peppers and things in there. And I do eat the plants. I, I, I do eat the vegetables. There's nothing wrong with it. Remember, it's getting clean and cooled, and most of the water is coming from the roof of your house, uh, not from the street. So it's 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 pretty clean. It's it's not as dirty water. Would you do? You wouldn't do a whole garden with them, though, right? Because you want to no. have the the long root systems of the native plants. So you'd have to kind of mix. Right. You you could put um, perennial vegetables in that are there all the time, like rutabaga or something, or not rutabaga, um, rhubarb or things like that, that are, that are perennial plants, that I would do. Um, you want perennial plants in your garden. You just, if you're gonna put in tomatoes and peppers, you just, or things like that, you, or beans or peas or whatever, you just wanna keep it along the edges or other places where when they die back in the fall and you don't want really a lot of bare ground. Great. Um, I think you kind of touched on this before, but someone wants to know um, about the like worrying about electric and gas lines before you dig out the garden. Right. So that's the what is the number here? Eight one one. Yeah. Um, so eight one one. Call ahead of time and have them mark out. And you you, you do not want to plant a rain garden with any anywhere near your electrical line. Water and electricity doesn't mix. Uh, shovels and electricity don't mix. So stay away from your 
electrical line at least two feet, if not more. Um, uh, water line, gas line, uh, they should be buried a lot deeper. You could probably build a rain garden right over the top of them and never find them. Um, but again, you don't want to hit them and uh, with your shovels or things and damage them or, you know, and hurt yourself or, or have a very expensive bill to get it fixed. So I, I reach, I find out where all those are first before I build. And then the, and that's the same with your septic, um, septic lines, whether it's for, to a, a cesspool or septic to the sanitary treatment plant. Okay, um, we have a few more questions, but I think we should just move on and then wait till the end so we can get to okay. the plant selection portion. Yep, yep, no problem. So, uh, uh, so the next thing is, um, oh, really? Is it almost eight o'clock or it's already 745? Holy cow. Okay, yep. <laughs> uh, plants, um, plants. So plugs are the most economical. These are the small plants. You can get them. These are like six packs of plants. You can find them at uh, places like Pinelands and the sales like Rewild or Audubon or um, Limpy. Um, then there's uh, quartz are, are the next least expensive. And then of course, gallon pots. So what you're doing when you're buying, buying plants is you're buying time. The smaller the plant, the less time it's been in the nursery. And then believe it or not, the more successful it will be putting it into your rain garden. You are, um, the bigger the plant, the longer it's been in the nursery, the less likely they're gonna be as successful for long longevity. So small plants are better. However, when you're planting a whole bunch of small plants, you don't get that instant gratification. So in the fall, I plant only plugs during any of the rest of the, because who cares if winter falls on them, they'll be perfectly fine and grow uh, uh, completely full grown the following year. Um, and, uh, but if I need that instant gratification or if I have a client that needs that, I will plant uh, uh, larger plants. Or if you really just want it uh, done and look looking completely a full garden when you're uh, done, you can spend the money and buy bigger plants. So uh, those large plants are uh, 12 to $24 a piece and the small plants are a dollar a piece. That's a big difference. Soil moisture tolerance, I told you I'd get to it. Um, this is when you tested your soil. So here's the good general rule. Um, if your rain garden is uh, nine inches, if you've tested your soils and your rain garden is drying out, um, in nine, or you can only build your rain garden nine inches or less deep because you have more clay soils and you have more moist soils. And so you're going to need plants that can handle more moisture. If your rain garden, when tested, is 10 inches or greater deep, um, uh, that means you have sandier soils, drier conditions, and you need plants that can handle more dry. So here's, here's the rule. There are three areas in your rain garden, the bottom of your grain garden, which is the wettest, the sides of your grain garden, which is partially wet, and the outsides of your rain gardens, which is, dry, which is dry. So think about that top, sides, bottom, okay? So all plants have a soil moisture tolerance, and you can find that online, you can find it in your nursery books, um, and it, they tell you what is their soil moisture tolerance. How moist is they, do they root the roots or their feet need to be to be happy? And so there are usually four categories. The first one is wet, um, which is your wetland plants. Moist, which is in that transition between wet and moist. Average, which is you know normal soil conditions and dry. So wet, moist, average, and dry. So here's the thing that most people think is that it is the right answer and it's actually the wrong answer. Most think people think that these gardens are wet all the time and they need wet moisture tolerant plants or wetland plants. And it's actually the opposite. You want dry plants that can handle water because they dry out so fast, they're actually dry 95% of the time. So you want dry plants that can handle wet, not wet plants that can handle dry. It's the opposite of what most people think. So, 
that wet moisture tolerant plant uh, is the one that we're going to remove. So we only have three left, moist, average, and dry. OK, here's the rule. For your rain gardens that are nine inches or less deep from testing, what that means is that you want to put your moist, moisture tolerant plants in the bottom, average up the sides, and dry on the outside. So for instance, this blue flag iris, very common plant here on Long Island, beautiful iris, native uh, here, needs moist moisture soil conditions. So you can put that rain guard or put that um, uh, plant in the bottom of your rain garden. Now, if your rain garden and then average and dry up the sides. Now, if your rain garden is 10 inches or greater, we're actually going to remove the moist. We only want to use average and dry plants. So now this, if your rain garden is 10 inches or greater, this blue flag iris is out. Uh, you're going to plant plants average in the bottom, average to dry up the sides, and dry on the outside. So it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Um, and, and you're choosing plants for its soil conditions. Now, your favorite rose, you know, uh, the family rose that's been in the family forever. Um, look, and you got a cutting and you're going to put it, you would like to put it in your rain garden. What you need to do is kind of find out what kind of rose it is. And if it's a family rose, it's probably an old shrub rose. And those shrub roses, uh, if you look them up online or whatever, are average soil moisture tolerances, most of them, not all of them, but most of them. So if your rain garden is nine inches or less, you can put that rose on the sides of your garden. If your rain garden is 10 inches or greater, you can actually put it in the bottom of your rain garden. Okay. Most people kill plants by putting sunny plants in shade and shady plants in sun. Um, so um, just because you love the plant doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Please make sure you understand its sun uh, uh, needs. So Marsh Blazing Star, Lytris Piccata, beautiful, um, moist, moisture tolerant plant needs full sun. So if you have it in the full sun area, that works great. Partial sun, it might not bloom as great. Partial shade and shade, you'll probably kill it. However, here are two plants that are different but similar. Um, big, this one is a big white flower, Culver's root, and blue lobelia, part of the cardinal family, or um, yeah, cardinal flower family. Both of these plants can only uh, can handle uh, full shade or full sun, but they can also handle mostly shade. They only need two or three hours of sun and they bloom beautifully. So please choose your plants in the right place. One of the things I hate the most is driving by a full sun yard and somebody's planting pastas in the middle of the sun. I will stop and get out of the car and ask you why you're planting hostas in full sun. There's so many beautiful plants for sun. Please pick the right plant for the right condition. Why are you gonna put that plant in a stressful condition for the rest of its life and, and just about kill it all the time from drought because it's too, it's too dry and too hot. Plant size, choose, look at how big the plant is going to be. Going to be. Look at the, the maximum height of a plant and do you have the room for it? So Joe Pieweed and Marsh Milkweed are two amazing moist moisture tolerant plants that can handle full sun to a lot of shade, but they need, they get five feet and seven to eight feet tall. In front of your picture window is probably the worst idea that you could do. However, putting it in front of the neighbor's hot tub might be the smartest thing you could do. So think about it, pick your plants carefully, and don't pick plants that you have to manage all the time, that you have to cut back. Choose plants that are gonna fit your site, not choose plants that you like, but now you have to manage and trim and, and, and cut back all the time. It's, it's um, you're going to forget it sometime and then you're going to be bummed about it being too tall. There are great shrubs and trees. If you want the height, there's a number of great trees and shrubs that will work great in your rain garden. Some of the shrubs like this chokeberry and nine bark are amazing wetland, or sorry, amazing rain garden plants. You don't need to be on wetlands. Rain garden plants. Uh, the nine bark needs sun to park sun. The, Black chokeberry can be uh, sun to almost 
full shade. Uh, the Ronia, the black chokeberry, these berries are very edible. Um, the squirrels will eat them and the birds will eat them. But if you want them, they make a great jam or jelly. In fact, I have uh, five jars in the refrigerator for, for my toast. Um, and then this river birch um, is a beautiful uh, tree that can handle it. Same with service berries or, or uh, your maples or whatever. Almost every tree can handle be perfect for a rain garden. Some plants are too aggressive. Do think about this. Aggressive does not mean invasive. Please do not use invasive plants. That's a whole nother story. That's a whole nother conversation. But native plants that are aggressive, like obedient plant, spreads by seed so quickly that you'll have a whole garden, you know, or cut plant will have a whole garden full of them. So please choose carefully your plants and so that you're going to be happy with them. And then don't forget your grasses and sedges. There's a million great ornamental grasses that can be found right here in Long Island. Uh, I love sedges. I put a sedge in every garden. Um, and there's, a, there's a 150 different kinds here on Long Island that can be used. So think about some of the sedges as well as these beautiful grasses like a little blue stem. And in shade, don't forget the ferns. There are so many beautiful ferns that people don't think about like this. Um, the one on the right is sensitive fern. The one on the bottom left is ostrich fern and the upper right is, or upper left, sorry, is um, maidenhair fern. And so these are beautiful ferns that uh, can be used. And then there's Christmas fern that's almost an evergreen, or it is an evergreen. Uh, so there's more and more ferns that are available that uh, look beautiful. You can use non-native plants and that's okay. So hostas and daylilies are okay. Not my favorite, but that's just my, you know, that's my opinion, not yours. So if you like hostas and daylilies, they're fine. Um, or some of the uh, cultivated species, like this is a short variety of red twig dogwood. Uh, my favorite one is called Arctic Fire. It has variegated leaves. Or this is a cultivated species of blueberries. It has more blueberries that, um, that people would like. And then here are some of my favorite native plants. Um, the blazing stars we talked about, butterfly milkweed would be a great edge plant in the front of your garden. Purple coneflowers, monarda, uh, asters, and black-eyed susans. All of these are great plants for your rain gardens. What I do here in Long Island is um, when I have flood problems, I will actually, if I have a leaching basin that has an inlet, I will build a rain garden around the leaching basin. So the water coming off the street or off the landscaping or out of a pipe, whatever, however it gets there, the water fills up the first bunch of the uh, of rain garden and, and soaks in the ground. And in this case, it's 12 inches. And when it's over that, it goes down the drain into the leaching basin. To show that off, this is at the Sisters of St. Joseph. So this was this parking lot island over here. Um, this water, every time it rained, the water would sit on this big area and flood. And so what we did is we remove this, this privet hedge behind it. We fixed this drain. And, um, and by doing that, we've removed the soil. So that was the hedge that was here. Removed the soil, kept the drain at its elevation. It's 12 inches higher than the bottom of the garden. So we've dug out the garden. We're putting in compost now. We're mixing that in. Then we're going to put down this mulch. And then, of course, once we have that mulch being spread, the next thing that we need to do is plant. And so, um, uh, of course, we picked the hottest day of the year to plant. So I may have had in this slide uh, 20 volunteers. <laughs> and then an hour later, I had 10 volunteers. And an hour later, it was just me and four others. <laughs> And it just got less and less, but it was a thousand plants that we planted. Um, this is Sister Karen in the foreground. Uh, she and Sister Mary Lou, the one in the pink, we were there until two o'clock that day. We started at nine. We did get the garden planted, um, but I'm going to tell you that Sister Mary Lou and Sister Karen and I probably planted three quarters of the plants, <laughs> but we got them all done. And uh, what was really interesting is Sister Mary Lou must be at that time in her mid 70s and she can plant faster than I can and I think I'm pretty darn fast. And this is what it looked like when we we're done. It looked pretty good. 
Um, and then what was really fun is it rained. Uh, next time I went out there, it rained right before I showed up and the garden was absolutely full, but you see that there's no water on the pavement and uh, it just stopped raining when I parked. I went into a meeting for an hour. I came back out and it was dry. That water soaked in the ground in an hour. What I would love for you to do is go drive by this. You now, you can't see the bottom of this garden anymore. The plants are, are up tall all the way around. The shrubs in the middle are even taller. This garden is absolutely jam packed with plants from edge to edge and you, can, and you can't see the bottom of the garden anymore. So I will take questions. Everything else is just pictures. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just show pictures of gardens um, as I'm answering questions. Great, thanks so much, Rusty. Um, I just wanna say if anyone does have to leave, cause I know it's eight o'clock where we are recording this. So you can always watch the, the rest of the questions. There's only a few that I see right now, but um, you can watch the rest of it later on. So someone asked, I, I'm not exactly sure what this was about. I'm assuming maybe about putting the water through a pipe or something. Um, what if you have a wide concrete skirt around the house? Oh, right. So if you have, a, uh, I've got a lot of those ho homes here in Long Island, the wide concrete skirt. Hopefully your concrete skirt is um, angled away from the house. So the water that falls on that, uh, on that concrete is going away from the house. If that's the case, then you can put your rain garden out beyond that and you're going to keep the water away from the house and put in your rain garden. And, um, um, and then if you uh, want to concentrate that water away from the house, you can use that French drain to um, collect that water on the edge of the concrete and put and bring it further away from the house if you need to. If you have the opposite, your concrete is angled as it's sunken in or, or poured incorrectly and is draining the water to the house, now you have water probably getting into your basement or crawl space, causing other issues. You're going to want to do one of two things, either remove the concrete and redo it or um, um, uh, jack up the concrete closest to the house and then and, and get it to be angled and then re-cement it on the outside. It's actually easier to remove than it is to, re uh, to jack it up, but both options are on the table. Great. Um, so I'm assuming this is a yes as well. Um, it, since vegetables can be used, um, they asked if, if herbs can be used as well. And I know mm -hmm. there are a lot of even perennial herbs. So I'm assuming that's a yes. Yes, that's a yes. So herbs, absolutely. Anything that's not really that you're trying to use the tuber or the, the root. So I won't do carrots or rutabaga or potatoes, but everything else is totally acceptable. Um, again, I do the perennials like strawberries and blueberries and rosemary and uh, things like that that are perennials more than I would want to use things that have to be replanted annually. Okay. Um, someone wants to know what type of roses like rain gardens, and I will give a plug for the native ones. <laughs> yeah, right. So my favorite roses, of course, are the native ones like Carolina rose, Arkansas rose. Um, uh, those are my favorites. Uh, they're actually my favorites, period. Not just because they're, uh, um, I think they're just, they're simple. They're lovely. They have this great smell. I, uh, I just think most people don't utilize them as much as they should. Now, with that said, all roses can go in rain gardens. It's just, uh, and most roses are, are um, average soil moisture tolerances. So uh, you can put it in the bottom on the, gardens that are deeper or that test deeper and on the sides in the gardens that test shallower. And uh, so I have roses in just about every ring garden that I've built. Um, I, it's a fan favorite, except for where I have deer problems. Where I have deer problems, I don't use roses because deer love roses. It's their favorite food. Um, can you just say where the Sisters of St. Joseph property is? I don't yes. know if you have no address yeah. or I do. It's 725 Brentwood Road. 
725 Brentwood Road. Um, absolutely go out there. That's where the Limpy the Long Island Native Plant Initiatives greenhouse is. Um, that's why I know the address off the top of my head. <laughs> um, it is. Um, it has a rain garden. It has a meadow. What's over my shoulder in my picture is the is the meadow that's out there. Um, it's eight acres in size now. Um, it was four acres. Now it's eight. It has a solar panel array with a native uh, 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 meadow underneath it. Um, it has uh, a whole series of other rain gardens now. Um, it has uh, it has a great CSA and farm stand if you really want great vegetables. All the vegetables are grown on the property and are organic. So um, you can sign up for the CSA or go to the farm stand that's right there at the front. Great. Um, got one compliment saying, thank you, Rusty, you're an excellent speaker. And oh, I, I agree. <laughs> but that's all the questions we have. Um, did you want to show any other pictures or? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm going to do a couple before and afters. This was uh, a house where the water came down the uh, off of the house and sat against this foundation and was getting into the ground or getting into the house. So what we did is we put a French drain right here, then a ditch, and then a rain garden in the foreground. And then I'm gonna put a bridge over the ditch. So here's the French drain, taking the water away from the house, then into this ditch. Uh, we're digging out the rain garden. We're putting in the bridge over the top. And this is what it looked like a year later. Um, and so it's, it's very full. And then, um, and then what's really interesting is, uh, or no, I guess that's it. So that's, uh, that's that one. The name, uh, this gentleman, once we built the first one, he built another one down here and his entire yard is native plants now, but that's a whole other story. That's a different topic. Um, uh, these are, what I like to do is add um, edging and borders and ornamentation to the gardens so that people know that the rain gardens, especially when I'm using native plants like this fence or retaining walls, um, pergolas, things like that. Um, where we, in this case, we didn't have a curb. So all the water comes into this uh, rain garden. It kind of looks like a ditch, but it's not. It's a shallow uh, bowl out in the front. Um, at the time of uh, this picture, you can see all the irises are blooming, the garden flocks and the um, uh, native flocks and the solid uh, um, asters and goldenrods and all these things are gonna bloom. So this garden is blooming from uh, early, uh, mid April all the way through October. You can have gardens that are a little wild and woolly or very ornamental and ornate. We have, you know, um, they don't have to be very big. This one's taking the water from the house uh, that runs down the sidewalk. And then we just took out a few bricks and put in a little ditch. So the water falls in here and goes into this rain garden right here. The plants that you can see, purple coneflowers, black-eyed Susans, um, uh, bee balm is this light pink flower, is um, lavender flower. There's looks like ironweed is about, uh, ironweed over here is blooming, marsh milkweed is about to bloom. So the, uh, there's grasses in front. This is the before picture. Uh, this is the after picture. Uh, this garden is uh, just six inches deep, taking water off the house through pipes outletting into this garden. So this was a slope. I told you the slope is important, is easy one to deal with. So there's that slope, there's the before picture. Here's that after we just took out the slope, put in a retaining wall and put in the rain gardens. And this takes the water from the garage, this takes the water from the house. There's a close up of that garden. Full sun. Partial sun, full shade. We can uh, work out just about anything. And your, I've made rain gardens that are Japanese styled, English cottage gardens, 
uh, you know, French bosques. I've done all these crazy different kinds of gardens, um, but a rain garden is just the bowl. Everything else you plant in it is up to you. A little more formal with plants in big rows. Or a little less formal, and uh, but still just as beautiful, a little more cottagey. I even tell you it's a beautiful garden, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> and then uh, this one's in Nassau County in Muttontown. Um, this is at the Suffolk uh, Soil and Water Conservation District. This is taking water from the parking lot in the driveway or at a church. And you don't have to use perennials. This one is a only shrubs. So we have red twig dogwood in the middle and low growth sumac around the outside. This was right at the time of planting. This is uh, five years later. And this is one of my favorite ones. This is taking water down this road, but what we're gonna do is we're putting in this curb, but we're letting the water come across this grass into this garden. And, uh, and, and I just built this garden and I just got the curb in. And then I had this monstrous rain. It's raining two inches an hour. And you can see that I'm not even filled up this garden yet. And you can see it coming right in. And you don't have to have a lot of space. This is the little space between this townhouse uh, patio and their street. And you can see we did it all the way down the street at every single one of these homes. And they can be very formal. This is one I did in Maryland. That is a boxwood hedge around the outside and a very formal garden inside. Or maybe a car wash. I think you would appreciate sitting waiting for your car with something like this in the background, watching the bees and the birds. And this is one that I built with my daughter when she was in the third grade. Uh, she's 26 now, so it's a long time ago. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put a ring on this, raise it up so that it holds six inches of water. We didn't even kill the grass. We just smothered it in, in cardboard or in mulch, not even cardboard. And we planted it. And then, uh, oh, I don't have a picture of it. Fine. When it was done, it looks absolutely stunning. Sorry. And one year later, and you don't see a weed in there, it's just all flowers. And I can't believe I don't have a picture of that. And then last one, last little quick design. You can see that in this case, we had a flooding problem in an intersection. And so what we did is we built three rain gardens at the intersection, one on one side of the street, two on the other. And that's when it was done. And of course, I'm out there during the rain and you don't even see the rain on the street anymore and you don't see the flooding anymore. And my favorite part is these are the people that built it. So this is, uh, this is a year later, the, that garden, the day we just finished planting it. So I, that's it. I just am, if there's any more questions, I'll take them. I look like, it looks like we have a few participants still on, so that's good. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for staying on. Um, we have one more question, but I'm assuming the answer is no because you went through all your pictures, but um, I don't know if there was something in there that we, you just didn't speak about. They asked if you had a picture with herbs or edibles in the garden. No, I didn't have one in this uh, slide presentation. I tend not to tell people to do that, um, um, but since it was brought up, I, I absolutely do do it. I, um, I don't have any problems with it, uh, but I don't usually, you know, tell people start planting that way. So I don't usually have it in my presentations. Great. I think that was it for questions. So I will just thank everyone so much for being here with us tonight. Uh, big thanks to Rusty for this amazing presentation. It was extremely informative. Um, 
And I hope everyone was able to learn a lot about rain gardens and be inspired to possibly go create one in your own landscape. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thanks again. And have a great evening, everyone. And a great evening. Keep, Thank keep you. a lookout for the uh, recording. I will be sending that out within the next week or so. Thank you very much. Thanks.